Hello and welcome to another edition of Mr. Walker's Apes. Today we'll be covering uh, and starting energy uh, resources, uh, which is chapter 17 in Miller's um, Living in the Environment textbook. Uh, I start with non-renewables just because um, it's well established, you know, we've been using non-renewable energy for a really long time. And so uh, we pretty much understand uh, non-renewable energy. So let's let's see what we're talking about here. All right, with non-renewable energy, of course, uh, we're talking about the uh, things we get out of the earth um, that take millions and millions of years to renew. So oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear, and uh, non-hydro renewable. Um, so oil, natural gas, coal, uh, those are all fossil fuels, uh, come from dead dinosaurs and things like that. Uh, and then, uh, you know, nuclear, okay, uranium. Uranium is not renewable, it's an element. We have a finite amount of it on this planet. Uh, so, you know, if we look over time, uh, we're increasing our uh, use of it. So this is the consumption. Uh, we're consuming a lot, and we're projected to continue to use a lot more. Uh, however, uh, renewable energies, okay, so non hydro renewable and renewable hydro, are also rising uh, ever so slightly. So, uh, you know, 99% of energy used to heat the earth comes from the sun, and the rest comes from the interior of the earth. Uh, and then we use the energy for all sorts of other things, okay? So, um, here is, you know, how we use it, you know, percentage-wise, okay? Uh, so the United States here, uh, we use a lot of oil, a lot of coal, a lot of natural gas. We have a lot of these, okay? Um, North America and the United States in particular is very rich in fossil fuels, um, and especially coal and natural gas, which is why it makes up uh, half of our energy. And then we import some oil from Canada and Venezuela and the Middle East. And then we've got a little bit of nuclear in there. Um, and we have a little bit of renewable. Uh, now, if we look over here at the rest of the world, okay, um, they're also using a lot of fossil fuels in general uh, and some about the equal amounts of nuclear. But the renewable is higher. And this is not because, you know, North America, yeah, well, the United States is pretty bad at, at renewable, but it, you know, we've got 11% as biomass for the rest of the world. That's because a lot of places don't use any of these. They're completely dependent on uh, the biomass, uh, meaning that they're burning wood. Okay, they're they're still in the uh, bronze-ish age, using uh, in terms of technology, using wood, fire and for cooking and heating and all those other sorts of things. Which is why they have so much more renewable because wood is a renewable resource. All right. So there are four major energy sources, uh, oil, natural gas, coal, nuclear. Okay, just know those off the top of the head. Uh, oil, where does it come from? Well, we get it out of the earth. Uh, it's like I said, it's dead dinosaurs. So it's organic matter that's been trapped in uh, rock for millions and millions of years. Um, so dinosaur dies in a swamp, a tree falls over in a swamp. 10 million years ago, it gets goes through the rock cycle. As it sinks into the earth, it gets heated and pressurized, and that results in oil. Uh, so we extract it, refine it, uh, etc. Okay. Um, oil is used for a ton of stuff. All right. Um, it's plastic. It's pesticides. It's in your makeup. It's in your car it's in your home it is everywhere okay without oil we wouldn't have plastic uh, for example so you know as much as pressure as there is to become uh, less dependent on oil we will always be dependent on oil f at least for plastic however we are starting to develop bioplastics made from potatoes and things like that you may have seen spoons that are biodegradable and such that are made from potatoes um, but it's still a long ways off before we're, we're, we're making those in mass quantities so what are we looking at here for uh, oil? Um, well, right now it's relatively available. Um, it, you know, 65% is in the Middle East, 9% in South and Central America, 9% in Europe and Asia, 7% in Africa, 5% in the US, 4% in the Asia Pacific. Um, now when I say US, I mean Canada and the US. So uh, we have geologists and, and petrol, 
petroleum specialists uh, estimate that we've used about 50% of what's available. Um, we're not finding very much more, okay? So for the future, uh, we're expecting that we're gonna peak in oil production soon, uh, within a few decades, at about 90 billion uh, barrels per year, all right? And f so what does that mean? Well, it means that we're gonna run out uh, relatively soon. If we've already used over half uh, and we're going to peak production soon, uh, we expect a sharp drop off after that. So we have about between 50 and 90 years of oil left, um, unless we find a whole ton more right now. Um, obviously with economics, oil is a huge, I mean, multi-billion dollar business. Uh, we fight over it all the time. Uh, many have argued that we've gone to war in the Middle East strictly for oil. So lots and lots of things with oil going on. All right, so what are some pros, what are some cons? Well, pros, it's, it's available. It's in all of our technology. It's easy to use, um, has really high net energy. Uh, so what do I mean, oh, sorry. So what do I mean by net energy? Uh, net energy is, you know, just like with uh, when we did uh, ecosystems, okay? Uh, you know, we talk about how as you move up trophic levels, you lose energy. Well, oil gives you just a really high net energy, so we're not wasting a lot in the terms of just burning it. Um, we do waste quite a bit, you know, that's what heats up, you know, things when you burn them, but it, it doesn't defy the laws of physics. So it's got high net energy, easily transported, because it's, you know, oil by itself is safe. You can touch it, you can do whatever. It's not really that poisonous or anything. Um, however, it's not always easy to get, all right? Um, it's located in a few countries around the world in large deposits. Uh, we're going to emit CO2, which is an air pollutant, so you get air pollution, water pollution. Uh, and I have low price as a con uh, because it's subsidized. Uh, oil is subsidized to the point where it is actually way cheaper than what it should be. Um, in the United States right now, it's you know right at the end of 2012, 20, beginning of 2013. You know, gas is uh, gasoline at the gas station is about a little under four dollars a gallon. Um, and that's primarily because the government, the U.S. government, subsidizes that cost. Uh, if we were to pay the real, true cost of it, it would probably be about twenty dollars a gallon. Um, well, so why is that a con? Why, you know, saving money is great, you know. Uh, well, it means that we use it way faster than we should. So we're going to run out way faster than we should, um, and that's a problem. So we're looking at alternatives like oil shale, shale, and tar sands. Uh, this is what we get from Canada a lot of the time. Uh, this is, you know, essentially uh, oil, but it's locked in rocks. Okay, so oil sh shale is shale, which is a really fine-grained sedimentary rock, which contains something called kerogen. All right, let me uh, see kerogen. Let me type it in. Uh, let me add a text box here for you guys. All right, so oil shale, kerogen, all right? Uh, kerogen is a mixture of chemical compounds. It's not pure oil, uh, but you can kind of, you can use it, all right? You can get it out uh, through chemical processes and turn it into oil. So it's more expensive. Oil shale is more expensive, but it's becoming economically viable, meaning we can use it. Um, and start making money on it because crude oil, the stuff you you know get out of the ground that's liquid, is is becoming so expensive. Um, and then you have tar sands. Okay, uh, it's really it's coal. Okay, it's bituminous sand, so it's it's coal that's been turned into kind of a sand, um, and it's really really. Uh, heavy, 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 heavy oil stuff, all right? Um, over time, of course, oil has different densities. Uh, you've got less dense oil, which will float to the top, and more dense oil, which will sink to the bottom of your oil deposit. Uh, as that oil sinks to the bottom, it will begin to mix with some of the surrounding soil and materials, and so it becomes contaminated. We can't put stuff 
like tar sand into your car. You've got to purify it. So once again, you adding you're adding an extra step, which adds extra costs. Um, but oil share, shale and uh, tar sands are becoming more viable uh, in terms of the economics because crude oil, um, the liquid stuff, is getting very expensive. Another alternative that we're starting to turn to is natural gas. Uh, natural gas is uh, methane. It it's, comes from all sorts of different sources. Uh, primarily, it's what it, it's the it's on top of oil deposits a lot of times, or coal deposits. Um, so you'll find a coal deposit, and above that coal deposit will be locked in uh, some natural gas, so we can get it out of the ground. Uh, we burn it to produce energy, we use it to heat homes, it's used for cooking, you know, it, it's all over the place. Uh, so we do use it, um, we have about 70 years, but probably more of natural gas left we're finding. We found a lot of natural gas recently in the Marcellus Shale, which is uh, in the northeast United States, runs from West Virginia all the way up to uh, northern New York and New Hampshire. Uh, and so we're considering it as a transition, and we are using it as a transition. The problem is that you can only transport it with pipe pipelines. It's a gas. It's not a liquid. Um, so you can't put it in a barrel and then ship it to a gas station. Okay, You've got to actually put in the pipeline, which is very expensive and time-consuming. So where is natural gas? Well, it's all over the place, uh, primarily in North America and Russia, though. All right. For whatever reason, those places that got covered in ice during the last ice age uh, have a lot more natural gas. And so we're getting very rich recently in selling natural gas to the rest of the world and to their own countries. All right. So the big three, uh, Canada, U.S., Russia. All right. So uh, this is from your textbook, again, Miller, Living in the Environment. Uh, this is just how do we use natural gas? Well, advantages, we have a good chunk of it left, about 100 years. It's got high net energy like oil. It has less air pollution than oil. Um, you know, it can be easily transported, but it has to be by pipeline, okay? You cannot transport this in any other way. It has to be by pipeline, all right? Uh, disadvantages, well, obviously it still releases CO2. Even if it's less, it's not the best. Methane is a greenhouse gas worse than CO2. So if, if you have a leak in a pipeline somewhere, you're gonna be releasing methane right into the atmosphere and that's bad. Uh, we can ship it across the ocean, but we have to liquefy it first. So in order to liquefy a gas, you have to cool it down. All right. Um, so they're cooling this uh, gas way down, like when they create liquid nitrogen and things like that. So liquid natural gas uh, can be shipped. Uh, and sometimes it's just burned off as waste. You know, sometimes you don't have enough natural gas to actually harvest, so uh, they uh, just burn it to get rid of it. Um, which is not great. You'd like to collect it. Uh, one other advantage I'd like to put under here is natural gas is now being produced from landfills. Uh, landfills for a long, long time, everybody thought was just kind of useless. They're, you know, you put your waste in there and you cover it up and you're done. Uh, but now a lot of places like waste management that owns a lot of uh, landfills around the United States, they're starting to install uh, methane collection systems or landfill gas collection systems and uh, those collect the methane, which they can sell off as natural gas, which is fantastic. All right, uh, coal. All right, we talked a little bit about coal with the mining, but um, where does it come from? We get it out of the ground, It's you mine it, <laughs> okay? It's a rock, uh, it's a special type of rock that just has a lot of energy in it. It is dead organic matter that instead of becoming liquid, became solid. Uh, we have a lot of coal left, okay? Minimum 250 years. Uh, maximum 900 years. Okay, we're not going to be running out of fossil fuels anytime soon. We'll run out of oil, run out of natural gas, but we'll still have lots of coal. Um, problem with coal is you can't put it in your car. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> unless we go back to the age of, uh, <clears throat> of steam powered cars and trains, uh, we're not going to be using coal for that. So um, it's available, not the best. Uh, so where is it? Uh, here it is in the United States. All right. Uh, West Virginia, okay, known for Pennsylvania, Ohio, Kentucky, known for their coal, okay. Um, if you've ever driven through Pennsylvania, they always have these billboards up, you know, Coal Miners Association, stuff like that, battling against environmental regulation of coal. 
Uh, you also have some coal out here in the Midwest. But we do most of our mining here. Why do we mine here and not here? Something to think about. All right, well, here's the answer. We mine here because this is in the mountains, and we can't really farm any of this land. This is all basically useless land along the Appalachian Mountains. Uh, out here, we can farm it. Okay, Iowa, Missouri, uh, Illinois, uh, and Indiana. Uh, very, very good mining soil, or uh, mining, farming soils. So they have lots of agriculture there. Well, if we mine it, like you learned before, you'd often destroy the land. So we would lose food production, and we don't want to lose food production until we absolutely have to. Where is it around the world? Well, all right, here it is. And, you know, obviously the United States, Eastern United States. Uh, Germany has a ton of coal. All right, Germany has a lot. Uh, China has a lot. All right. So Germany is the industrial powerhouse of Europe, and China is the industrial powerhouse of Asia. I wonder why. All right, coal is huge. It's, it runs so many factories. All right, so the types of coal. All right, you go from the really cheap, uh, not really coal, uh, peat. You can buy peat at uh, Home Depot. You put it in your garden. All right, it's decent stuff for fertilizer. Uh, not so good for burning. All right, if you burn coal or peat, it's just gonna like go poof, and you're not gonna have anything. You're not gonna get a lot of heat out of it. All right. Uh, it also retains moisture, so you add peat to uh, gardens to hold moisture during drought. And then we start moving up through uh, the bad stuff to the good stuff, all right? Uh, lignite, not great. Low heat content, not the best. Bituminous, um, this is probably what you see the most often. Bituminous is um, okay. It's kind of your medium line type of coal. Uh, you get good heat. Um, but it's, it's really, really cheap because it has a lot of sulfur and it also doesn't give as much heat as anthracite. Um, so this is used because it's cheap. And then anthracite's the good stuff. It's super highly desirable because you pollute a lot less and you get the most heat out of it. It has the highest carbon content, uh, but very, very expensive. So these are the two that are used in industry. Lignite is not really used at all. Um, and peat is only used for gardening because it's not coal. Can't use it for energy as well. All right, so what do we have? All right, advantages, uh, lots of it. High net energy, low cost. Um, you know, you can get it just by mining. Uh, disadvantages, coal is the worst for the environment between the sulfur, the mercury, the nitrogen, the carbon, everything that we're putting in the air, it is absolutely terrible for air pollution all right, and air quality. Uh, but it, it is, you know, like I said, it's available. So, you know, at some point we're going to have to make a decision. You know, do we switch from the clean natural gas back to coal just because we have no other energy source, or do we try and get back into the renewables and stuff? So here's some pictures of uh, some mining, all right? Uh, you, obviously, these are acid mine drainage. Okay, don't forget about that. Acid mine drainage, spoil piles from coal mining. And here's just a picture of some strip mining going on. All right, this is all coal, all this black here. And that's a pretty big machine. Um, so you can see how thick these layers of coal are. In Germany, they actually had, um, uh, it's a machine that's even bigger than this. Uh, and it actually, on the end of it, it has kind of like a wheel that just continuously scoops out coal and they can like mine out the entire coal seam in uh, you know a matter of months instead of years so so the future uh, what can be done well we're starting to burn it differently rather than just chuck the coal in the fire and say we're all done uh, we're starting to burn it at lower temperatures we're starting to uh, do what's called air scrubbing um, you hear about that more in pollution, but it's basically you add chemicals to the air which absorb the sulfur and some of the other contaminants and keep them locked away in a solid powder, which can then be landfilled instead of putting it into the air. Uh, and of course, um, you know, coal can't be put into a car, but there are natural gas cars. So you can actually convert coal into a, either a liquid coal or a gaseous coal, which can be used in the ways that we are now. Again, extra step means you're losing energy to do it, and it's going to cost more. All right, on to nuclear power. Uh, nuclear power is uh, 
exactly what it sounds like. We're using uranium to heat water. Okay, so we're we're using the fission of the atom to heat water. So this is steam. Okay, steam, not smoke or anything, uh, which turns a turbine. Okay, so you heat the water, turns the turbine, generate electricity. Uh, if you're not sure what a turbine is, just Google images turbine. All right, um, you'll probably see a million different pictures of it. So where do we use nuclear power? Um, you know, all over the place, uh, except for the extreme pover impoverished uh, nations. Okay, the, the ones that are very, very impoverished are not getting it, um, or ones that we consider to be a threat. So like Iran and Iraq. Okay, they're not going to be getting it uh, anytime soon, just because. Uh, we think that they might actually use it to make a nuclear bomb and kill a lot of people. Uh, France is using a ton of nuclear power, okay? France and Spain use a ton. Um, uh, France gets, uh, I think it's 98% of their power from nuclear, so they don't import any, hardly any energy at all. Uh, Spain is getting there. Um, Italy stopped, okay? Italy stopped. Um, few other countries have stopped also. Uh, North Korea stopped because we made them. <laughs> um, you know, and then the U.S., we kind of have like a, a standstill. We're not really doing anything else because people are afraid of nuclear, um, especially after Chernobyl in the Ukraine um, and Three Mile Island in the United States. Uh, and most recently in Japan now, of course, we had the Fukushima uh, partial meltdown after they were hit with a tsunami. So, you know, some people are very wary about uh, nuclear still. Um, but it is clean. I mean, you know, there is waste, but there's no air pollution. Um, you do have to mine the uranium, so you've got the mining impacts just like you do with coal or natural gas. Um, but there's a lot of things we can do with it. So, uh, you know, how do we do nuclear? Well, you uh, it's pretty simple. You mine it, okay? You enrich it, okay? That's where uh, Iran is at. They're trying to enrich their uranium, and that's what we're trying to figure out, you know, how far along are they? Um, and you do that with a centrifuge. Uranium out of the ground is very impure. You have to purify it. That's what they mean by enriching it. Uh, and so then we can uh, put it into a nuclear power plant. Once it's in a nuclear power plant, you have a couple options. You use it until it's spent. All right. If it's spent, then we have to put it into caskets. These like steel and concrete reinforced uh, caskets that prevent the radiation from escaping. And uh, those get put into the ground forever. Uh, for about, it takes a minimum of like 15,000 years before it ever becomes safe again. So for uh, you know, for a human, that's forever <laughs> because we don't live that long. Um, but uh, so this is what the United States does. We take it, we use it. A rod is good for about eight years, and then we uh, put it in the ground. Um, what uh, France does is they take it and they reprocess it. And what you can do is you can re-enrich the uranium, uh, which makes it use usable again. And then you can reuse it, and you can reuse it, and you can reuse it, and you can uh, reprocess uranium three to four times before it's no longer good. Okay. So pros and cons. Pros, no air pollutants, like I said, and it can last thousands of years. We have enough uranium to last 2,000 or more years, so nuclear is not going anywhere anytime soon. However, it is very inefficient. Heating water of any type is very inefficient. Uh, you know, mining, you got the problems with the mining. You get thermal water pollution, which we'll talk about later in water pollution. Um, obviously, the, sa the radioactive and safety problems, and it's very expensive just to keep it safe. So lots and lots of problems there, okay? All right, so uh, we kept talking about this thing called net energy. Um, here it is in, uh, in terms of our new energy, okay? We talked about net energy efficiency and laws of thermodynamics back in ecosystems, but we need to give you a refresher, okay? So the net energy is the total energy you get out of a fuel minus the energy it took to get the fuel. So net energy, N-E, okay? equals the energy of the fuel minus the energy to get it. So for coal, uh, if we were to burn a pound of coal, we would get 100 kilowatts of energy. But if it took 70 kilowatts of energy to get it, then you only have a 30% efficiency because you only have 30 kilowatt of actual power out of that, 
all right um, and this kilowatts you know to mine it is the machinery the people the electricity all that okay and that's considered high okay 30 percent is considered high energy efficiency for these things uh nuclear is about two percent efficient so yeah okay 30 is high all right so here's your common efficiencies um a plant like a tree okay a tree is one percent efficient it converts one percent of the sunlight that hits it into usable energy uh which is stored and then we eat okay the incandescent light bulb, which are now being phased out in America because they are so inefficient, are only 5% efficient. 95% of the energy you put into a light bulb is lost as heat uh, in an incandescent light bulb. Flu fluorescents are 15% efficient, so it's pretty, it's better. Uh, the new LEDs are about 25 to 30% efficient. Um, so coal is 30%. We can go up to 60% with technology, but most plants don't do that. All right. So laws of thermodynamics, okay? Like I said, uh, you know, we're always, uh, you can't get rid, you know, you can't, energy cannot be created or destroyed. That's your first law. The second is that you're always losing energy, all right? Anytime you do anything with energy, you're going to lose some, okay? So first law, cannot be created or destroyed. Number two, entropy, okay, or chaos of energy, the disorder of the energy is always increasing and uh, law three which doesn't concern us it's more for chemistry or physics is at absolute zero there is no kinetic energy no energy at all all right so for us all right uh first law you can't create or destroy it what we have is what we have okay that's it all right second law is that we're always losing it so when we mine the mine out of the ground we're losing energy when we burn it we lose energy when we send it down the electrical line we lose energy when you plug in and, and charge up your ipod you lose energy okay we're always always losing energy just like in the uh terrific pyramids of ecology all right so now for renewables all right let's try and go through these fairly quickly i guess uh renewable energies Okay, hydroelectric, solar wind, geothermal, biomass, tidal, and hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, hydroelectric is pretty simple. You have an upstream par portion where you create water pressure. You let that water pressure push water through a turbine, uh, which creates electricity. Okay, so a turbine is a little thing that spins. Uh, this spins a wheel, which generates electricity, and then that's sent out. Okay, so we create dams to create the water pressure necessary to turn the turbine. All right, so who uses it? Uh, Norway, 99% hydropower. They're, they're set. They've got renewable hydro forever. Uh, New Zealand, China, US. US only uses 7% hydropower, even though we have lots of large rivers. Okay, Mississippi, as far as I know, doesn't have a single hydroelectric dam on it. All right. Uh, pros, obviously no pollution. Uh, cons. Well, you've got to create a reservoir. You've got to create a lake. Uh, that's going to displace some people because you go from a river to a lake. A lake takes up a lot more land. Um, the fish can't pass through the dam as easily, and uh, so it, it can be a problem. And also, the downstream river is going to become smaller because the water is not flowing through as quickly. So here's the Conowingo Dam. This is in Maryland. Uh, it's off the Susquehanna River, opened in 1928. You can still drive across it to this day. Uh, it's an interesting drive. It's a very narrow road across the uh, dam, um, but it does generate quite a bit of electricity every single year for us. Here's some more pictures. Okay, next is wind. Uh, wind is really growing, really fast. Okay, uh, Denmark no longer burns coal and is using wind only pretty much uh the united states is getting there we're starting to okay uh, but it's not going to solve everything and wind has its problems like what if the wind doesn't blow all right um so here you got pros uh decent energy efficiency um no pollutants low environmental impact um there is some study some studies that show that it has an impact on bird migrations a little bit uh, but you have to have steady winds. you got to have winds of between 20 and 30 miles an hour pretty much constantly. And those only occur at the tops of mountains. 
uh, for the most part. So it's really hard. Uh, you do have noise pollution, just like your fan at home. As those blades spin through the air, they create noise. And then what we call visual pollution, which isn't really a form of pollution. It's not harming anything. It just is ugly <laughs> for the most part. Uh, so what we're trying to do is go from big ones like this that are uh, you know, generating electricity for a lot of people to basically just putting little tiny ones on tops of homes and businesses that generate enough electricity for that home or business. All right, solar is the next one. Solar is considered renewable even though the sun is burning out slowly. Uh, it's considered renewable because it'll be here for another three to four billion years. Uh, if humans make it that far, then I'd be really surprised. So, uh, yeah, it's considered renewable. Um, and there are two types. There's passive solar and active solar. Active solar is what you, you, you guys usually are seeing. Uh, this is the the solar panels and stuff like that so um, we estimate that it could provide 25 percent of the world's energy because you can't put solar everywhere it has to be sunny a lot of the time for active solar uh, so this is what we mean by active solar like I said it, it's these solar panels okay solar panels solar panels solar panels uh, here's what it looks like when you cover a large area of solar panels problems with solar panels yeah you can't put them everywhere okay you gotta have the sunlight they're l not efficient at all um, they actually reflect most of the sunlight back um, and you have to have a huge amount of land to use them okay now if you cover your your entire roof with solar panels you might barely have enough uh, power for your home they are not efficient and they take up a lot of space as you saw here I mean the, this these this number of solar panels would probably power a single factory and that's a huge amount of land. All right, um, passive solar is different. Uh, I don't really have a slide in here for passive, so let me, let me add a slide here. All right, um, passive solar is uh, not what you think it is. It, it's essentially um, uh, you're storing the sun's energy. Uh, for a longer time. Think of it like a battery for the sun. So what you do is you put a, like a window which allows the sun in. Okay, sun in. Uh, sun hits concrete. All right, and the concrete will store the sun's energy for hours. And it slowly uh, releases the sun's energy back into the house and so it's a way of keeping your house warm uh, for uh, um, longer periods of time but not indefinitely okay and you could probably feel this during the summer you know you go stand on the concrete instead of and it feels warm on your feet uh, geothermal uses the, the uh, earth's own heat uh, to heat water. Um, it's hard to explain. Uh, let me see, I might have, let me see if I have a video. I know that I made, or a student made a really good video on, um, on it, but I don't know if I have it right now. Let me see, I think I do. I just gotta find which class it was. Okay. So let's see if I can shrink this down to the right size here. I'm probably gonna have to let's see. Sorry, I apologize here. I am trying to get this to be the right size, so I just need to go play it in a different one. There we go. All right, so this I can shrink down.
All right, so you've got two wells, one that injects water, one that pulls the water out. <clears throat> so you've got water underground, all right, and it's heated up by magma. So what we're going to do is we're going to put a well in here, okay? This is down to like 10,000 feet, a very, very deep well. Well, that allows the water to come up, all right? As it comes up, it turns into steam because it's not under pre the Earth's pressure anymore. All right, <clears throat> and now it's going to go through the whole plant here and turn some turbines and do work for us in that way. Okay. So it's essentially using Earth's magma to heat up water, which is then turned into steam, which allows us to basically use like a steam engine. Okay. All right, so that's what we can do. Uh, with that. All right. <clears throat> so most people use it. You can even use it in your own home. Uh, you can get little geothermal things installed in your basement. Uh, they're very, very expensive though. Okay, so we've got geothermal plants in various parts of the world. Uh, it is very, very, very efficient. Okay. Uh, no, no pollution really, not very much land use. It is expensive and it is not very available because you have to put it where the Earth's energy uh, can heat water. Okay. Uh, biomass, pretty simple. Uh, you're burning wood. Okay. <laughs> um, nothing much there. Uh, you do have to have a lot of land, obviously, to grow the wood. Um, but you do have some large potential supply. Like if we cut down the forests of Canada, we would have a lot of biomass fuel for a very long time. Uh, and then we're starting to get into things like ethanol, okay, which is uh, made from corn, like corn ethanol. It's mixed with your gasoline right now. Um, all sorts of other things. So we call it gasohol. 10% ethanol, 90% gasoline. That's what you know goes into your car engine pretty much. Okay, uh, we're getting bacteria to start making this too, so it's it's got some promise. Okay, and then tidal. Okay. Uh, tidal is using Earth's tides. The moon gravity pulls the ocean up. Ocean goes up and down with the tides every six hours. Uh, there is potential there. Okay, as the water flows back and forth, we can use that energy. Uh, so here it would be like a, this is one out of water. This is a tidal turbine out of water. It just looks like a fan. Okay, and as the water moves back and forth across these blades, it turns them, and by turning them, we turn a turbine which generates electricity. Right. So there's lots and lots of promise there. Finally, hydrogen fuel cells. Uh, we've, you know, the hydrogen highway was built in California, kind of fell through. Um, basically, we want to put hydrogen into our cars. Okay. Uh, hydrogen fuel cells are promising, but super expensive. Okay. Uh, this is like half a century away really, in terms of us being able to practically use hydrogen, because it is very, very expensive, and um, it's hard to distribute, and, you know, you can't really, there's no such thing as a hydrogen fueling station on the highway right now in Eastern America, so what are you going to do? Well, you've got to convert all your gas stations over to hydrogen fuel stations. You've got to ship the hydrogen. You've got to produce the hydrogen. You've, it's just all the cars have to be converted, all the trucks have to be converted. It's it's a ways away. All right, so I would say maybe towards the end of your lifetimes, maybe, if we don't discover something else before then. Okay, so uh, really long video this time. Energy is huge. There's lots and lots to cover. Please make sure you cover chapter 16 and 17 in your textbook um, because there is so much on these different types of energy, okay? So I think that's it for this time. Uh, I hope you learned something. You can put, uh, you know, questions in the comments on the YouTube video or something. And uh, so yeah. So anyway, hope you learned something, and I'll see you next time.